Our second scripture reading today comes from the book of Acts. This takes place when Paul is in Athens and he's going to be at a place called the Areopagus. Now, this, uh, there's another name for that. It's called Mars Hill. I'm going to refer to that in the sermon. But when you see Areopagus, that's what I'm talking about. It's Mars Hill, okay? While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he argued in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons, and also in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Also, some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers debated with him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others says, he seemed to be a proclaimer of foreign divinities. This was because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus and asked him, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? It sounds rather strange to us, so we would like to know what it means. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found, them among, I found among them an altar with the inscription, To an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breathes breath and all things. From one ancestor he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live, so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring." Since we are God's offspring, we ought not to think that the deity is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of mortals. While God has overlooked the time of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day which he will have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance all to all by raising him from the dead." When they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some scoffed. But others said, we will hear you again about this. At that point, Paul left them. But some of them joined him and became believers, including Dionysus, the Areopagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others with him. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning, to begin with, I'd like to invite my wife to come up. She's going to read you an original poem that she has written. Good morning. So this is just a short poem that I wrote um, one fall day after taking a walk in Bessie Woods and just um, contemplating the trees and solitude. So here it is. I have been told that the roots of the trees mirror the branches spreading above, that as tall and wide as the branches extend to the sky, so the roots extend beneath the ground, deep and wide into the earth. How much of our world is hanging upside down, underground? Is there a magnificent shadow of myself suspended? My silhouetted subconscious self, aware of all the thoughts I try to catch, but that never reach my lips and never flow through to my pen. Hello down there. So I wanted to start off with a poem today written by somebody in our congregation. I just happen to know her fairly well, so I was able to get her to come up here and do that on my behalf without too much arm arm wrangling. And we're going to hear different varieties of poems today as we go through, because as you know, we are talking about God and poetry. 
But before I get into that, I just want to say we only have three sermons left in our God and Art series. We have today, next week, and Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve, we're going to have a sermon at 8 o'clock. And at 11 o'clock, there's going to be a film shown. The sermon at 8 is called God and Photography. And it is based on the photographs that you all have provided for us for the art exhibit. Have you all taken the time? Have you had a chance to go out and see some of the exhibition out there? They are your stories. So I hope that you will have the opportunity to go out and take a look at them because they are wonderful. Many of the stories that you submitted to us are absolutely amazing. And I think it's a real testament to who we are as a church. And then at the 11 o'clock, I will show a film that I've been working on for the last couple of months. Adam is scoring the music as we speak. He's working through it. And it's going to be a really neat evening to see how it all comes together. So I hope you can come to one or the other, the 8 o'clock sermon, the 11 o'clock film. But it will be a real testament to who we are as a church and to what we believe here. Today, of course, we are talking about God and poetry And you all may or may not be aware that poetry is really the foundation of everything that we learn in the world. As a child, you actually learn the foundation of language from poetry. And think about it. When you were in preschool, right, was your teacher up there? Did they get get up on the chalkboard and they said, okay, we're going to do it together. A, A, B, B. No, did they do that? No, they didn't do that. What did they do? They did A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? That's how they did it. They did it with a song, so it was easier to remember. And indeed, everything that you learned in the world was actually a reflection of the rhythm and rhyme of poetry. Some of you might be familiar with the most famous of all children's rhythm and rhyme little poems. It's about a spider. Do you know what I'm talking about? Would you be willing to do it with me? Oh, I know it's tough. I know you're not going to like it, but let's try it anyway. Adam, would you lead us in it to start us off? <laughs> itsy bitsy spider, fun on the water spout. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain. And the itsy bitsy spider went up the spout again. So you guys are good, not bad. We can start our own a cappella group together, don't you think? You good. So what is this little children's poem? What's it teaching you? Well, it's teaching you a bunch of different things, right? A, it teaches you that spiders, they like to make their webs, their nests, and gutters and downspouts. And that when rain comes down, what happens? They usually get caught in the water that's flowing by. They get shot out of the gutter or the drain. And then they have to sit there and wait until the rain is over. And then what are they going to do when it all dries away? They're going to climb back up in that thing, and they're going to make sure that the web is just right. And they will do that over and over and over again, just like you have to sing that song over and over and over again. Now, the reason why we teach children with poetry and rhyme is because it's easy for kids to remember the rhythm and rhyme of poetry. But as we get older, we abandon poetry in favor of a more direct means of learning. In fact, I would say that by the time that we get into high school, we have all but lost our sense of what poetry is about. I mean, most of us, we have a unit or two in English class of Shakespeare, Walt Whitman, and Edgar Allan Poe, but besides that, we're probably not going to be dealing with too much poetry. And part of this is just the economics of poetry. How many of you in here write poetry for a living? I just want to know. Oh, that's right, none of you. Because most of you don't do that, right? That's not something that you can do very easily. I can think of three people in the modern world who could actually write poetry and make a living off of it. The first absolutely comes to mind is Shel Silverstein. You all know who this guy is, right? Where the sidewalk ends? When I was growing up, this guy's book of poetry was in every classroom and every elementary school all across the country. He must have done pretty well for himself. This was a very common thing for little children to read. And I loved it when I was a kid. Another really famous poet is actually Billy Collins. Now, some of you may or may not be familiar with him, but Billy Collins, he's a poet laureate, and he became famous for the poetry that he wrote following 9-11. And so if you follow poetry at all, he's actually a big name. That's a really good book of poetry, Nine Horses. And then probably the most famous poet who died recently is Maya Angelou. And of course, her poetry on the civil rights movement and the plight of African Americans has been read by people all over the world. 
Now, beyond those three, though, beyond those three poets, it's hard for me to think of any other poets who actually can make a decent living off of this. And so as a result, I think what happens is we tend to see poetry more as a hobby rather than something you're going to claim as your primary occupation on your W-2, right? And because of this, most people, when you write, what are you going to do? You're going to write literature or nonfiction because that actually makes you some money. So if you're drawn to poetry, you're usually going to try to sneak that poetry into some other mediums. So for instance, we talked about kids' literature. That's a big thing. Good way, if you're a poet, to get your stuff out there. Dr. Seuss, great example, right? Now, Dr. Seuss, this is a guy who really had a sense of how to structure words and rhythm and rhyme. He really knew what he was doing, but it wasn't just that. It was his illustrations that drew children into his books. That book was written in the early 1960s. My kids love that book. That's how universal the appeal is with what he was able to do to create a book like that that just goes on forever. Another way that people sneak uh, their poems into the world is through music. They take music, right, and they combine it with their poetry, and then people buy it. So, of course, perhaps one of the best examples of this is Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan's lyrics are extraordinarily poetic. And so what we're going to do is we're going to play a little piece, a little verse of a song here for you to see from Bob Dylan so you can see the poetry behind what he does. Oh, what did you see? My blue-eyed son Oh, what did you see My darling young one I saw a newborn baby With wild wolves all around it I saw a highway of diamonds With nobody on it I heard 100 drummers whose hands were a-blazing I heard 10,000 whispering and nobody listening I heard one person starve, I heard many people laughing I heard 10,000 talkers whose tongues were all broken I saw guns and sharp swords in the hands of small children And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard Oh, it's a hard, a hard rains are gonna fall Thank you very much. Of course, these days, the lyrics you hear on the radio are not quite that deep, so poetry has seen better days, I think. And I think one of the unfortunate consequences of the decline of poetry in our culture is the fact that we are losing touch with what poetry can do for us as people. You see, the beauty of poetry is that you are not given all of the pieces. The poet is very dependent upon you as the listener to fill in and visualize many of the things that are not said there. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. Let me give you a short poem and show you kind of some of the ways that a poet works with this. So here's a poem. Tree, red leaves, wind. I didn't say it was going to be a good poem. I just said it was going to be a poem, OK? So this is the poem. Tree, red leaves, wind. Now, of course, with this, you have to do a lot of imagining because you have to take those three elements. And that could be anything, right? You could do anything with that in your mind. You're not given a lot of structure. You just have to kind of come up with whatever you come up with in terms of taking those three elements and putting them into your mind. But we like it, don't we, when things are more spelled out for us. We don't really like it so much when we kind of are left out there. So what if I said this? If I said, the tree with red leaves blows wildly in the wind. Now, that's much better, isn't it? That's a little bit easier. It gives you more to kind of work with. And I think that the reason why we like to have things spelled out for us in the way that we do is because of how our culture has evolved in terms of the ways that we tell stories. So where do we get most of our stories from in our modern world? Where do they come from? They come from television and movies, right? That's where the vast majority of us get all of our stories. 
And this medium is actually a really great medium. I mean, it's a wonderful medium, but the thing about television movies is that it hands you every aspect of the story. When somebody walks in a room, do you have to imagine what the room looks like? No, you see it right there. Do you have to imagine what the character looks like? No, there's an actor right there. Do you have to imagine the inflection and the tone of their voice? None of that. It's all right there. The sounds, the music, it's all around you. And unfortunately, I think this has had an impact on our imagination. Because when everything is handed to you, you develop certain expectations as to what you want to see from a story. And let me give you another example of how TV and movies, how they've impacted us. Let's just talk about the pacing of a story. So if you go back, if you look at the history of film, let's just start in the 1930s when films started to become really big. If you go back and you watch some films from the 30s, you will see that most of the time those stories, they unfold very slowly over a long period of time, which was a reflection of the books, of how people read books at that time. The books, they would unfold very slowly over a long period of time. Even if you go back and watch, you will notice that a take so a take, by the way, is just like what you're seeing from the actors acting. When you watch that, it will last sometimes upwards of 30, 40 seconds, one single take, where you're just watching them go back and forth and talk. Whereas if you start to fast forward, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, it's mostly the same. But then when you get to the 70s, and particularly the 80s, all of a sudden, things shift. And the stories begin to speed up dramatically. If you go home, just pay attention for just one second to the television that you watch and a story on television, some television show, it's going to cut back and forth very, very fast. You usually will not stay on a particular sh shot for more than two or three seconds. And so what we expect is that the story is coming out very rapidly, very efficiently. Otherwise, what do we do? We change the channel, right? We get tired, we move on. And that word, efficient, is really important here. Because in our culture, everything is expected to be efficient, right? So let me give you an example of just how efficient we've become. So 10 years ago, if I sent you a text message on your phone, and I said, hey, how are you doing? You would have to reply back, and you would have to say to me on your phone, you'd say, oh, well, I was stuck in traffic today, and my air conditioning wasn't working, and so I was sweating, and I was really upset. Now, that's 10 years ago. Today, do you know how you respond to a message like that? You send emojis. That's what you would do right here. This is what you would send to somebody, okay? You don't even need to send the, the stuff anymore. That's supposed to give you the same basic idea as language. So supposedly, this is a very efficient form of communication. If you all have children, this is how they communicate, by the way. So you look at something like poetry, and poetry is also a very efficient form of communication. Poetry uses something called intentional deletion, where they remove words to force you to slow down so that you have to contemplate the meaning. And herein lies the contradiction. I find this contradiction to be very interesting. Everything in our culture is efficient so that we can move faster, whereas poetry is designed to be efficient so that we can slow down. Isn't that interesting? You have the efficiency of culture to go faster, but yet you have the efficiency of poetry to slow down. And in my opinion, the reason why God is dying in our culture is the same reason why poetry is dying in our culture. When everything in the culture is designed around speeding up, going faster, then one of the negative byproducts of that mentality is that you have to be spoon-fed everything. Because if you're going quickly, right, you don't have time to sit there and reflect and try to understand something. It needs to be easy, quick, very simple to understand. Just spoon-feed it to me, give it to me, so then I can have it and I'll move on to something else. Otherwise, if it's not that way, well, you're just going to leave it behind. And this has serious implications when we're talking about something like God. Because God is not an easy concept to understand. Would you agree with that? Maybe? No? Was the itsy bitsy spider, was that it? Was that, am I done now? Are we, did I, did I use up all of my, my points there? Okay, God is a difficult concept to understand. It takes a lot of imagination to think of God. And I don't mean that in the way of you're making it up, although some people might come in and say, yeah, you are making it up. If you are going to see God's presence in the world, 
you have to have a certain level of imagination. And to give you a sense of what I'm talking about, this entire God and Art series is proof of that. What do we start with with this God and Art series? We start with some piece of art that seemingly has nothing to do with God, and then, eventually, by the end, we see how it informs us of God's presence in the world. But what does it take for you all to see that? Well, it takes you sitting here for 23 minutes while I make the connections between all of those things, right? And that's a long time in our modern world for somebody to sit and listen to a person talk. If I were a television show, you all would have changed the channel a long time ago. But thankfully, you're stuck here and you're not going to go anywhere. So even if you're bored, you won't get up and leave me behind, right? The instinct that we have to change the channel, that is a huge reason why the younger generation, the millennial generation, my generation, is ultimately abandoning the church. It is simply too boring for them to sit there and listen to somebody like me speak for that long. If you can't give me the takeaway in two or three minutes, it's not worth my time. That is my generation, I admit to it, okay? We have a short attention span. And ultimately, that has a big impact on everything because if you need the takeaway to be quick, that's not God and Christianity and Jesus. How many of you all have been coming to church for five years? How about 10 years? How about 20 years? Right? You're getting into decades. Many of you are here week in, week out, Sunday after Sunday, and if I polled you and I said, hey, do you have this thing down? Do you know God, Jesus, Christianity? Many of you would say, no, I'm getting closer, I'm edging closer to it, but, you know, that's why I'm here every week. I'm trying to learn a little bit more, right? It's a challenging thing, and God cannot be reduced to some small digestible soundbite. It doesn't work that way. And so, if we're going to really appreciate God, we have to slow down. I know in our world, every one of you is going quickly. Many of you are forced to go quickly by the way the world works. But when it comes to God, we have to slow down. And poetry is a wonderful tool when we're talking about that. I have found that when you sit back and you read something like a poem, it gives you the ability to get in a space where you can really contemplate God in an amazing way. And so, to that end this morning, I would like to introduce you, some of you will already know this poet, but I would like to introduce you to the most famous poet of the 20th century, because his poetry can give you an entirely different perspective on life, and it can give you this ability to really sit down and contemplate God in an amazing way. So the poet I'm talking about is Khalil Gibran. Have any of you ever heard of him? Okay, some of you maybe have, some of you haven't. So Khalil Gibran, this is him when he was a young boy, he was born in Lebanon in 1883. And for the first 12 years of his life, he had no formal education. He was basically taught by some priests who would come by his house every so often, Arabic and the Bible. And then, when he was 12 years old, his mother said, we're going to immigrate to the United States. So they go to the United States. They end up in South Boston. And he ends up going to an art school there. And it's at this art school that he meets the artist Fred Holland Day. Fred Holland Day, the only reason why you might know who he is is because he was the first person to ever try to promote photography as a fine art. And so Khalil, he meets Fred Holland Day, and I think that that photo that you saw is actually a photo taken by Fred Holland Day of Khalil when he was a boy. They get together and he says, look, Khalil, you have got all this talent, but you got to nurture it. You got to do it right. And so for the next three years, Khalil, he's painting, he's writing, he's doing all this stuff, and his mom says, hold on a second, Khalil. You are absorbing way too much of Western culture. I want to send you back to Lebanon. I want you to absorb some of the culture of your homeland. So she throws him on a boat. He sails all the way back to Lebanon. And this proves to be some of the most important time in his life in terms of what he becomes as an artist. If you've ever read any of Khalil's work, his poetry, you will find it to be both profound and inspiring. And the fact is, is that the reason why it's profound and inspiring is because it's this wonderful synthesis of Eastern Arabic thought and Western Christian thought. And he is able to kind of take it and put it into these beautiful little musings on life and these poems, and there's people who just love what he writes. In fact, people all across the world have fallen in love with his poetry. And he ended up writing The Prophet, which is his most well-known work, in 1923, 
And he ended up dying not long after that in 31. And it wasn't during his lifetime that it became super famous. It was when the Beatles, Johnny Cash, Elvis, have you ever heard of those people? I don't know if you have. Okay. So they found the prophet, and they started reading it, telling people about it, and they even included some of the poems from the prophet in their lyrics. That's how influential it was. And so it introduced this work, the work of Khalil, to an entirely different generation. Now, when I read the prophet, I have to tell you that I feel like I've gotten a little bit more in touch with God's presence. It's like reading from the book of Ecclesiastes, which I find to be a very contemplative, poetic type of book. And when I read from those poems, it feels as though he has just been able to touch on these little grains of truth. And those grains of truth, it makes me feel like I've stumbled upon God's presence. Because when you stumble into God's presence, it's usually when you've touched on these larger grains of truth. And so when you read his poetry, it's like you're talking about God, but you're not talking about God. Do you know what I mean by that? Like, his poems are not about God, but yet it feels like they're about God. And this is something I really want to drive home for you all today, which is to say that a lot of Christians believe that if you're not talking directly about God, like I'm doing right now in a, in a sermon, if you're not talking directly about God, you're not talking about God. But I've come to find that most people experience God not through direct contact, like here in a church, but through indirect means, through sources that you wouldn't necessarily associate with God, which is why we read from the book of Acts a little earlier today. So, in the book of Acts, what happens? Paul, he goes to Mars Hill, and he's having a conversation with the Athenians. And he sees, remember, do you remember how he talks about how, and this is Mars Hill, by the way, this is what it looks like, it's a big rock. He's up there, he's talking with them, and do you remember how he says that he saw, when he was walking through the city of Athens, this, this altar that says, to an unknown god. Now, does that, God, that, does that altar have anything to do with the God of the Jews, Jesus, or Christianity? Nothing. It has nothing to do with that. It was not made with that intent. But he uses it as a source to talk about God. Something that you wouldn't necessarily associate, but it's his way of engaging with the people of Athens about this idea of who Jesus was. Which is a really good way of doing things. And I have found that what Paul does at Mars Hill, that in fact... That is one of the best ways for us to talk about God in our culture today. You all are the exception. You are not the rule. Most people are not willing to sit here and listen to a person talk for all this time about God. But I have found that when somebody is deeply touched by something like a poem, that that opens them to this much larger understanding of who God is, and they'll talk about it with you then. And so as I end this morning, I want to encourage you to find opportunities in your life where you can talk about God, but not in the way that you would normally think. I want you to take time in your life to step back, to slow down, and to have conversations with people around you. And you don't have to do it in a church, and you don't have to start with the Bible. You can start with anything. It can be a book, a poem, it can be a piece of art, it can even be a television show or a film, as much as I bashed those two things earlier today. Take your time, go out and do that. And in order to get you in the mode of doing this, I actually would like to show you on a film that I created, one of Khalil's poems. So this is from the prophet, it's called On Children, and it stars our very own Lily Hendrickson, Adam's daughter. She was expensive, so you have to realize that uh, we're going to have to probably take up a separate offering just to pay for her. And she's, she's a hard negotiator, let me tell you. So you're going to see her in the film, and you're going to hear Khalil's poem, which is a beautiful poem. And my hope is, is that you'll go home, you'll Google the poem, and you'll take time to talk with your family or your friends about it, because it's a beautiful poem. And on the surface, it has nothing to do with God. But when you dig down deep, I think that there's something in there that you could really have a wonderful discussion about. So just remember, God is not confined to this place. There's a lot of places where you can find God in the world, and it can be as simple as a poem. And so I give you Khalil Gibran's On Children.
Your children are not your children. They are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but not from you. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. You may give them your love, but not your thoughts, for they have their own thoughts. You may house their bodies, but not their souls, for their souls dwell in the house of tomorrow, which you cannot visit, not even in your dreams. You may strive to be like them, but seek not to make them like you, for life goes not backward, nor tarries with yesterday. You are the bows from which your children as living arrows are sent forth. The archer sees the mark upon the path of the infinite, and he bends you with his might, that his arrows may go swift and far. Let your bending in the archer's hand be for gladness, for even as he loves the arrow that flies, so he loves also the bow that is stable.